basically on the meat pens, uh, got pliers here, and kind of give you a little bit of outline of how to do the meat pens. Um, uh, my name is Daryl Hall. Uh, I've been raising rabbits since 1977. I've uh, been doing it in California since the early 80s. Uh, we've shown all over the United States to uh, different conventions and different things. Uh, we've won meat pens at a couple of conventions and placed high some of the others. Uh, actually put, won some single fryers at a couple of conventions. Um, but uh, I always like doing the meat pens. I still show all that shows here in the state of Michigan and throughout. Uh, but uh, so we'll get started here. Uh, basically, I have eight things that I like to go over. Basic things to do the meat pen raising the meat pens. Um, first one is selecting your stock. Uh, choose a breed that's a commercial breed: Californians, New Zealands, Champagnes, uh, Satins. They're the ones that are going to do the best for you when you're showing competition wise. Um, I always like to have four H kids in that get a buck and two does because that way when you breed them, you're not just dependent on the doe, one doe having babies, and if she hit misses and you don't have another doe, then you're done. Or if you have two does, hopefully both of them will have them, and you'll be able to come up with a pen of three. So that's why I kind of kind of go towards having. Two does and a buck. It just seems to work better. Uh, figure out when you need to start your breeding. Uh, what you want to do is, like, if your fair is, say, first of August, count back 100 days, and that's when you want to start the breeding program, uh, breeding your does. Uh, if you can stay in that 100 to 95 days, that's where you're going to be at the top of your class. Um, it just works the best for you. I always like the ones that dough is bred. If I can, I like to get put her in a pen that she's gonna kindle in. That way she gets used to the surroundings and has a better, not gonna get upset when she starts to get ready to have her litter. Um, just do a little bit better job for you. Um, get your nest box ready. Uh, I know some of you have probably raised a lot of rabbits in nest boxes and that. Uh, commercial breed, like California, what I raised. This is the size box I use here. Um, just seems to work. You know, they have enough room in there. Uh, the dough can get in, move around. Once the younger, you know, moving around a little bit, they got space to move. They can go in and out. Uh, a lot of times the dough, she'll, she'll get up on top, or some of the young ones will get up on top. Uh, I also have some pens that are open completely open on the top. Um, I use those basically in the summertime. They work pretty good. Um, the big thing I just like to have a little bit of space up where the young can't get out the first week. And once they get out after that, usually they start to get their eyes open and they can uh, find their way back in. Um, one thing I know, if you're gonna use nest boxes, you wanna use something that's like just plain wood. They don't want to use treated wood because uh, they do a little, some chewing on it and stuff and you know it's not going to hurt them if you chew on some of that wood. Um, but uh, I like to use I like to use the like the shavings or the chips that you use in horse stalls. I use them in the bottom of my cages um, when I bring rabbits to shows. I put a, a layer of that down and I put a layer of pine chips, the, the bigger chips, um, and then straw. I always use wheat straw. I don't ever use oat straw. Um, I don't know if you ever look, grew up on a farm. Um, you grow it on a combine when you're combining oats. That dust just gets on you and makes you want to itch and scratch. I don't want my rabbits to do that. I don't want the babies to do that. I don't want them to, to do well. I should say kids, not, not babies, kids. Um, after the dough is kindled, uh, I look to see if there's anything that's out of the ordinary. Uh, she should, the dough should have a nice nest built and have fur in there for the to cover them with. Um, 
especially in the fall and in the early spring, you want to make sure you have the rabbits covered so that they're not going to get cold and you lose them. Um, and I always, I always like the first day, I like to count to see how many kits are in the, in the box. So say the doe had eight, okay, a couple days later you can count again, and if you only count six, then you know, okay, either two got out, and they may have got down on the ground, or crawled out, or two may have passed away, and you want to get them out of there, especially summertime, because you don't want them to draw, you know, flies in there, and that's for the rest of it. After 10 days, I always like to check to see if their eyes are starting to open. Uh, they may not every one be open at, at 10 days, but in that 10 to 12, 14 days, they should have their eyes open. Every once in a while, you'll get one that will stay closed. Um, I just take like a, a little moisture thing and rub it on there and kind of pull it a little bit so it opens up. If they don't open up quick enough, they could end up blind in that one eye. So you want to just keep an eye on that and see what the, how it's going. Um, next thing is start your feeding program. As far as the dough, the first couple days I just uh, have the same feed as I normally do. About five ounces for the cattle coins, five ounces. Uh, after three days I just start to increase it a little bit because uh, she's going to need a little bit more to produce some milk for her young. Usually the, the kids will start coming out of the nest box somewhere between 15 to 20 days and come out and start nibbling a little bit. A lot of times you'll see where they, you know, the pellets that long, they'll bite off half of it or something. You'll see some on the ground, but once they start eating, um, you want to start increasing the pellets to the dough, dough and litter. Um, at five weeks, beyond the dough and litter will eat almost at will. Um, but I still like to keep some rabbit food in front of them. Um, but I don't want to overfill it either. I want them to eat it through, up every day. And then at the end of the day, you know, they're looking for some more. They're, they're coming to the, to the thing and want to be fed. They want to, I want to eat. Um, so I keep, keep, keep going to them. Uh, Weighing and selecting. I like to start weighing and selecting rabbits at about six weeks. Yes? Can I ask a question? Why, why do you want them to keep coming to the feeder and be interested in the food? I like to have them be just a little bit hungry so that they, they come there because I don't know if you if you had rabbits and you fed them and you overfed them and then they leave some. Well, then the next day they leave some and they won't eat that what's over in the corner. You know, how they know that it's a day old or two days old. Uh, if they eat everything up, they're gonna eat everything up. And that's, what, that's what I want them to do. Um, and if you feed them too much, then they just get overweight too, especially like your, your does and your bucks. Not the, not the little ones as much, but your rest of your uh, herd. Um, I like to have them. I feed, I like to come up with a time that I feed every day. Um, my basic time is between six and eight in the evening. Um, I feed all my single rabbits five ounces, and they'll eat it all up. Most of them I have to eat all eight up in the morning when I go out to water them before I go to work. Um, but uh, you know, I just like to have them keep that fresh food in front of them all the time. Um, the meat men's they'll eat once they get to that six weeks. They'll eat pretty much everything you give them any day anyways. But most of your feeders will only hold about six cups. Um, so a lot of times if I have a big litter of say eight in the litter, I'll give them six cups at, at the night when I feed. The next morning I'll go to water, if they've ate everything up, I'll just maybe give them another cup and see if they eat that. Just kind of keep, keep it going to them. Um, just stays well. Do you feed hay also along with the pelleted food? I, some people do. I've never fed hay to my rabbits. I just go with the feed that I feed. All my rabbits get the same feed, um, whether they're small, big ones, they all get the same feed, 16, 
16% protein. Um, and they, they do well. Um, you know, they do well on it. Um, like I say, I start, I start to wait three to six weeks around that time. But you kind of get, like, get them out to get to handle them a little bit so they get used to being handled. Also, you kind of track the, the pen, you know, um, when I'm doing pens for like a national convention or something, I'll actually, I'll actually take and I'll take a marker and maybe put an opposite ear that I'm going to tattoo, put A, B, C, D, E, or however many some letter. And that way when I get them out, looking at them, I'll go, okay, I like A, C, and E. Those are the three that I like the best you know, right now. Uh, I keep track of them. Good. I got some sheets here to help you track too when you're when you're raising meat pounds. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you, you can tattoo them when they're in that six to seven weeks, eight weeks, uh, but they'll help you track them too. You can keep track of them by numbers, um, and then you want to weigh them and say, okay, these four are weighing basically the same. These two are smaller. Uh, I got one that's big, you know, but there's seven. So you want, to, and so you want to start matching up, you know, not only in the weights, but you want to make sure you're matching up type-wise. Uh, you know, it doesn't do you any good to have three rabbits that weigh the same, but they're different type. You know, one's weak in the shoulders, one's real good in the midsection, but it's weak in the lower hindquarters. One. I always say you want to put three peas in a pod. Um, that's what you go for. Um, if you're a couple ounces off in weight, but they're all the, the same type and everything, you're going to do better. Um, so body type is not important. Body type, body, to me, body type is important. You know, you want that nice firm body, you know, nice commercial type bodies on them, and good flesh condition. Um, I like to get them those nice wide loins, not only wide but, but deep. Uh, I do fairs and judge fairs and stuff, and when I'm doing meat pens, I kind of handle them like I like picking from. Uh, I'll check that loin, I'll, I'll check the depth of the loin, also check that lower hind quarter, you know, the back legs. We want that nice firm flesh in that, that bottom. And when you go over the rabbit, you know, if you go over it, set it up, pose it right, and it shows undercut there, then basically there's not enough flesh there in those back legs, you know, built in. Um, yes? Why do we like them firm? I like them firm because, you know, meat buyers, they like that firm meat that they're gonna do. And if I'm raising them for myself, and butchering them, I like I get a nice firm condition wrap. I don't like them real soft and, you know, um, usually when they're soft, they have a lot of extra weight put on as far as fat. And it, so if you keep them nice and firm flesh, usually you, when you butcher them, there's not as much inside, you know, fat in there. Um, and when you get them out and have six, weeks or so, start to handle them, they match them up, they, they get used to being handled. So when you get them on the table, when the judge is judging them, he can take your three rabbits, get them out, set them, pose them up, and you can step back and say, oh, okay, yeah, they look basically the same, you know. But if you don't handle them, and you just tattoo them like a couple days before you're gonna go to your fair or a show, they're like all over the place. And when you get them out, you know, and you get one out, and you get the next one out, and you're jumping around, and it's hard to track them and see how they really look. Um, and it just helps them later on, because if you're gonna keep some of them for, for a show rabbit, you want them to get used to being handled, used to being set up, posed right. Um, so you, so you wanna do that. Um, and then I uh, highlight some of these sheets I have up here. You can track your weighing, you know, for future future litters, uh, you know, if they're tracking real good, the weights and stuff, and you're matching them up, you know, you say, okay, I want to match that again. 
especially if you do well at your fair, and you have, still have the, the dough and bucks at home, you can do that combination again and possibly do good again the next year. Uh, so it's good. Uh, making the final cut, uh, at this point you should be able to narrow down in each litter which ones are going to be the ones that are going to show. Uh, I always say you have a better chance of win on the pen if you choose three out of the same litter versus taking one out of this litter and maybe two out of this litter or one out of three different litters if you have that because usually they're not going to match up. Um, you know, especially even like um, with different breeds, their colors are not going to match. I mean, even though they may be all Californians, they may, this one have real dark ears, this one may have a little bit lighter, not quite as dark. You just put some may have lighter ears. If you get them all the same litter, they're basically going to look alike. Uh, check your weights, check your body type. Uh, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do fryers. Uh, you want to check your fur. Uh, there's a few more points on fur, so you want to make sure you got good fur. Um, even the pens, you want good fur on them if you can. Um, match the pens to have good type, uniformity, and condition. Um, like I say, like I said earlier, you, know, you want the weights as close as you can, but don't get caught up in that and not have the body types and the three of them with us. Um, so is it kind of like taking the standard and duplicating it three times? Yeah, you want to you want to take the type, you know, for, for a commercial rabbit and then you want to say, okay, good shoulders, good midsection, carries the weight down to the table, you know, and you want all three of them to look like that. Um, you don't want to have one that's got low shoulders and the other two are nice shoulders and that. Um, you're not going to place as high in your class. But they all have to meet the ARBA standard, right? They can't have any disqualifications? Right. That's one thing too when you go over, you want to check for disqualifications because that's, if one has a disqualification, then the pen is disqualified. You know, whether it's a broken tooth, a missing toenail, um, so, it's still all so you all want you all want everything to be right. You know, check the eyes. You know, anything that could be a disqualification because the judge goes over them and if he goes, okay, this one's missing the toenail, or this one's, you know, has a broken tooth, he's going to disqualify that one and it's going to disqualify the pen. <coughs> yes. So I've never done meat pens, and I'm going to take it back to our club. But the difference between, like, I know a meat pen is the trio. And you're talking about fryers. What's a fryer versus meat pen? So same age. Both. Same age, same age, but it's only one rabbit versus the three. Okay. That's fryer. Okay. And if you, okay. if you go back farther in your thing, you'll see. You'll oh, see you where talk about. Can't tell about single fryers and okay. roasters and skewers. Yes. Do you have a preference? Uh, for a pen that, that weighs three and a half pounds or four and a half or five and a half? Like, does it matter? Um, I like, now the, the standard meat pen is three and a half, five and a half. You know, so you want to be towards the top if you can. So if you're around at five pounds, maybe five and a quarter, to me that's good. But if you're down to say, 375, four pounds, you're not gonna do as well because there's gonna be a lot of pens that are gonna be bigger. They're gonna have a little more flesh, they're gonna have a little more tight. If, you know, the younger ones, the smaller ones are probably ones that, you know, you just barely got them bred in time to come up with a meat pen pretty fair. That's why I like to stay in that 95, 100 day breeding thing so you've got a chance to get them to the bigger. I know it used to be three to five pounds, and now it's three and a half to five, five and a half. Well, I kind of like the three to four, the five pound range more, um, but some of, the, so some of the other breeds wanted to go to a little bit bigger, which is okay. The, the commercial meat buyers and that like to have the rabbits, you know, around that five, five and a half pound range. 
systems are processing. Um, like I say, once DQ'd, both Ben and Gal show, keep the rabbits. I know they're young rabbits and that. Keep them as clean as you can. You know, even when you're showing, you know, and I say that with the meat family, but I say that with your adult rabbits that you're going to show, like in your juniors and six eighths of seniors. You want to you want to keep them as clean as you can, especially if you're doing Californians, New Zealands. You know, you got the white, and if you're not white, it just kind of takes away from them. Um, and then I always tell the kids, you know, smile and have fun. And you know, that's a big thing. You're you're going to your fair. You're having fun, you, you know, you're talking to the other kids, you're, you're showing against other kids, and you're just having fun. Once you're done showing, congratulate the winners, whether it's you or, or someone else, you know. And if you didn't win this year, it just gives you that incentive to, okay, I gotta do a little better next year, and just keep keep on track. Um, but it's always fun. And I, and I do it with, I show at open shows, and whoever wins, they always shake their hand. You know, so, um, any any questions? Yes. Do you keep the? How long do you keep the kids with the dough when you're doing a meat pen? Okay. When I'm doing meat pens, I keep them with the dough until the day that I'm going to the, the fair or to a convention. You know, so they're ten weeks old, basically ten weeks old. Um, uh, I was a superintendent for a county here in Jackson County, and I used to track, I'd ask the kids when they brought them in, I said, Julian needs it six weeks, seven weeks, whatever. But they would tell me, and I'd kind of write it down. And then there'd be some that would keep them until 10 weeks. Well, then when I got two days, checked in on Saturday, we showed on Sunday, and then I would check them on like Tuesday, ones that were weathered does the 10 weeks, they were firmer flush and stayed that way the rest of the week versus the ones that got taken away early. It was just something I tracked and it, it seemed to be that way. But, uh, I did it for myself though. I, I always kept them with, with the dough. You know, if we left to go to the show tomorrow, they were with the dough until we packed up in the morning and went to the show. You know, even though I already had them picked, and then I still kept them with the dough. Um, one thing you can do is if you have a real big litter, like say eight or ten, and if you have two doughs that you bred, and the other dough only had three or four, you can transfer some. And what I do is take a take a needle, I put it in the opposite here. I'm going to tattoo, take some ink and rub in there, so it kind of see it'll have like a little little dot in the opposite here so I know that those came from the litter this bigger litter and I know which ones they are this gives you a way to track it a little bit better um, so, uh, so with the white rabbits do you have any tips or tricks of keeping the white white just keep your pen as clean as you can I mean use wire um, you know when I first started raising rabbits, I had, you know, two by fours for the outside and the wire bonds. And then I go, uh, they're backing up and usually they'll kind of go to the same corner all the time. And, you know, if you don't keep it real clean. So when, once I started going to all the wire cages, I still keep them clean as I can. Um, just, you know, once, once a week or so, just kind of go and, you know, depending on how many rabbits you have. If you have 100 rabbits, it's a little hard to keep up with them, but I still, I still go through mine, and, and I have, I think I got 96 holes okay, for rabbits, so. Just kind of mix it up a little bit so you can stay on top <coughs> of it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Like I said, I got some other flyers up here. There's one that you can record your market pen production records. You can keep track of weights per week. Um, 
here's one that I made up on nutrition. You know, what to want to want to make sure nutrition water gullets. You want to stay on top of that, or other other things you can use. Um, here's a little thing on first aid. Things you can keep around your rabbit tree. So if you, you know, safety glasses. Keep for protection. Got other stuff here. Um, different ointments for different things for things to use. And I have one here for operating expenses, so you can start tracking. Say you buy your rabbits, and what you purchase them for, and then all your expenses, your feeds, and anything you can use, you can track it. Say, okay, uh, it cost me this year this amount of dollars. <laughs> do I want to do something different? Or, you know, so it gives you a little way of tracking things. Just something I kind of came up over the years. Um, here's a little flyer on, on some different feeds. Uh, I know it's just marina. It's, I feed marina, but there's other feeds out there. Um, I always say for commercial breeds, they're cows and New Zealands and that, you either want to use a 16% or an 18%. Uh, I like the 16%, 18% sometimes to feed and feed a little bit more. It's, it's, it's a little bit much and they get a little softer in flesh condition. Um, that's why I like to say I feed the same, a five ounce thing and kind of keep them in condition and keep track of them a little bit. Um, I don't want to overfeed my does because they're going to put on that extra weight they're going to have a little harder time when they have, have their orders and stuff. Um, I like to keep them a little bit, maybe not hungry, but so to go out to feed. And I like to see them come right up to the cage and hey, give me some feed. You know, so you talk to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, when's the best time of the year to buy breeding stock if you were wanting like a buck in the Breeding rooms? stock? Yeah. If I'm going to do breeding stock for 4-H, you know, I tell a lot of kids, you know, get them in the fall, you know, maybe get a, a breeding in the fall, but if not, get them early spring so you can breed, you get a litter early spring, and that way you can raise the litter, so, you know, six, seven, eight weeks, and maybe that litter you can take away, depending on when your fair is, and then you can breed for your fair. So you kind of get a little bit of, how the doe is reacting and how she litter's going. Um, as far as getting them at the last minute, sometimes it just runs a little crazy. You know? um, and most of the time, you know, a lot of the breeders will have, you know, this time of year, early spring, like the safe race show or the spring convention show, they'll have some breeding stock. Um, I mean, I try to have breeding stock year round, but streets a little bit sometimes but if we breed for fair how often should we breed besides that to keep the dough going like instead of just breeding them once a year is that okay or should we be breeding them like a, a few times to I like them? most of my doughs I breed four maybe up to five times at the most per year um, now people that used to raise them for commercial type thing and they were selling year round and stuff. I know some people that used to get eight litters a year. I mean, they're having that dull bread. <laughs> they're having a litter. But uh, I can get four litters a year. You know, I try to rotate my, my stock a little bit anyway, so uh, I try to always introduce new stock in the spring. Young does, bring them in. Um, just seems to work out, rotate them a little bit. Because most of the time your does two, you get two, maybe three years out of them, and the litters start to get smaller, and you, know, you just have a little bit better chance. I like to use, like in the summertime, if I'm breeding does and that, I like to use some of the younger bucks versus the older bucks, because the older bucks can become sterile. When it gets over 80 degrees, they can be sterile for six weeks. So if you use younger bucks, you just seem to do better. And I like to use younger bucks on my older does 
just seems to get the litters, you get a little bit better. I like to shoot for like six, six kids per litter. Um, sometimes if you do two older, I don't want to buck, sometimes you end up with two, three in the litter. Um, and then you'll kind of see your does, the litters will get smaller as, they get, as the doe gets older. On track yes. Yeah. Should is it best to like outcross and have a bunch of, to get tracks from different breeders, or is it better to just get from one place? Um, I always say, okay, when you look at your herd and you're looking at improving your herd, it's like taking a puzzle. You got to put pieces together. Okay, so if you have a couple does in a buck and you breed them. You know I mean? And you're saying, man, I wish I had better shoulders. Okay, you want to maybe go out and get something that's got real good shoulders to bring into your stock, you know, so you can improve your herd. Um, or if you need a, a wider loin, you, know, you want to do something that way. Um, and I, I mean, I, when I go to conventions and stuff, I'm looking for something to help my herd. I'll walk down the aisles of Californians and say, Okay, that's what I want right here. Now, that, that rabbit may not win, but it's got what I need to improve my herd. Um, so it's just something to look at if you're looking to improve your herd. You know, what you come up with, say you brought, bought two does and a buck and you bred them and you're going, eh, I wish I would have a little bit better of this or better of this. You know, then you can say, okay, this is what I got to improve on. And, you know, you may go to a different, different breeder and say, you know, okay, we're going to bring this in. Um, I like to, if I'm going to bring something into my herd, I like to do it on the bucks, probably on the doe side, because I don't want to breed a bunch of, a bunch of my does to a buck and then none of it works out. Or if you bring it into a doe, you can breed one time, try it, say, okay, yeah, that doe matches up and it improved, you know, with the bucks I have. You know, a lot of the raising rabbits, I mean, like I say, I've been doing them for a few years, uh, since 77. So it's just putting the pieces together, kind of seeing what, what's out there and trying to improve. Um, Do you find that if you have, like you bring in a doe to fix an issue, do you then line breed the baby back to her to continue fixing it, or don't you think line breeding helps? Uh, I do some line breeding, but I mean, I did where, like, a buck to a daughter, and then a daughter to a son, but then I'll go out to maybe, maybe it's got some of the background in the third generation and that, kind of keep it going a little bit, some of the same genetics. Um, you actually, once you've done rabbits for a number of years, you kind of see, okay, your best rabbits came out of these, these five rabbits here. You can track it back in the, in the pedigrees and say, okay, yeah, that's coming back up in here, this one's coming back. But it basically comes on five, six rabbits that you can track it. Did well for you. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to do that, but um, to keep your pedigrees, you can kind of go back through and look at it and see. That's why I always like to get. I'm going to buy a rabbit, I want a pedigree rabbit because you can track it a little better. And most everybody nowadays pretty much keep your pedigrees to know. Any other questions? One thing I will tell you if you raise, if you do the Californians, Sometimes you'll get some of the Californians, if they get chilled a little bit, it'll get kind of a grayish looking fur. Okay. They can still be shown in your meat pen. They can't be disqualified for having that gray, gray color to them, to their bodies. Um, once you get into juniors, then it has to be gone away. But when they're fryers and meat pens, you can have that kind of grayish tint to a, their 
for um, years ago we were getting ready to go to a show and I uh, was looking at the rabbits I wanted to take and I thought, man, I really like this rabbit here. It's got the type for a single fryer, but it had, it had that grayish color. Yeah. For the amount of money I was going to pay, I'm going to take that rabbit. Well, we had 40, 40 single fryers and the judge that was judging them, when he picked my rabbit out, he put it behind. I go, well, I'm going to either be the first one off or something. He's going to disqualify it or something. He went through and judged the class and got down to the top five. And went a couple more and got down to three. And then he pulled that one the line out, put it back, and judged the other two and got down that rabbit out of mine and said, this rabbit has discoloring a little bit, but it's the best rabbit that I have here today. It has a type, it has a condition, it has a name. Okay. <laughs> so that was, that was good. But, but yeah, it's just something that they'll get chilled. If they get chilled, they'll get that grayish color to them a little bit. I, want, I have found that some of them that get chilled like that, they do have better fur once they get older. They'll have a better fur and a little bit better condition of fur. Um, it, it goes so they kind of lose it they'll, when they go through a molt? They'll, they'll lose, lose like it. They'll, they'll, it does kind of go off, yeah. Once they lose the baby fur, it goes off. Um, but uh, I had a guy that raised Californians years ago, a long time ago. And they were telling me that he used to take his litters once they were born and take them in the house and put them in the refrigerator for like 20 minutes. So he'd get, they'd get chilled and he'd put them back out. So <laughs> I go, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, said that, they said that it worked for him and he got better, better, <coughs> better, better um, color. So, I mean, I've, sa I've saved rabbits, uh, letters that had them on the wire, picked them up, and they got chilled a little bit, but I've taken them in and took a hair dryer, got them warmed up, let them get their heat back a little bit, or maybe overnight, and put them back out with the bill the next day. And that worked. I mean, I'm okay. Yeah. I've saved a lot of them over the years. So with the fairs that you've done, mm -hmm. have you ever seen reps used in the in meat pens? In the meat pens or anything? Because I'm hearing more and more about it, like in um, uh, like home settings and stuff. People are starting to use reps more for a meat rabbit, but you don't see a lot of reps. Also, like you, like I say, you'll see it in New Zealand's, Californians, satins, champagnes. They're your main top four. Um, but I haven't seen other other breeds. I mean, I've even had you know, Checker Giant, uh -huh. yeah, which, you know, you basically got a lot of bone. <laughs> you, know, you don't have a lot of meat on them. Um, Flemish, you know, I've seen a, a few Flemish ones. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever seen a Rex pen, but uh, I'm sure there has been it somewhere. commercial type rabbit, you want that nice shoulder, you want to hit that high point in the middle, right up from the, from the hips up to, and carry it right down to the table, nice and full down there. Uh, I know, and I'm, I'm a, probably a, a crazy one, but when I set my rabbits, I like to take their back legs and get them flat. Just give them just a little bit of push up, not push them up to try to get height. I try to have the height from my rabbits themselves, not having to push them up. So, uh, a lot of times, if you push them up, then it looks like they're undercut. Yes. I have a question about breeding. Mm -hmm. um, I had New Zealands, and this past spring, I had two young does. It was their first breedings. Both of them gave me only three kids. Okay. Is that the doe or the buck? Uh, 
Could be either. Uh, how, are, the, are the does young? Are these young does? Or? Yeah, they were um, the previous year's babies. Okay. Was the buck older? The buck is five. Five, five years old. That's probably the buck. Yeah. You may, I don't know if you still have the does. Try a, a younger doe, or a buck on them, and see if they get bigger litters. That's, that's what I would start with anyways. They still have small litters and they're saying, okay, maybe genetics a little bit, you know, it's just not gonna have many animals, but for the most part, most does will have anywhere from five to eight. Then you'll get the doe that has 10, 11, 12. Is that with like one fall off or two fall offs? Do you? As far as? Like when you're smaller, breeding, do you try and get like one oh, good fall off or oh, two? I usually put the, I always take the, the doe to the buck's cage to breed. Okay. And usually he'll breed, he'll breed the doe right off a couple times and then take them out. I know I've had guys that tell me, well, I'll breed them and then bring them, take them back in eight hours. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know if it works or not, for sure. But usually if they breed good and fall back, you know, they're gonna get some good litters. Yeah. So. Yeah, but if you take the buck to the doe's cage, she's gonna be a little more, upset because she's going to protect the cage if she's so that's why I always take the doe to the next cage yeah. yes. how long do you leave them in for sometimes it's only a few minutes and, you know five minutes and I break rub the doe two or three times and I put them back in the cage So like when we did our Santa Angoras, we took both of them out and put them on our grooming table. Like oh. It was a bigger table, but yeah. So it's okay. I don't know, they get a little bit, sometimes your bucks will get a little bit more protective in their cage and that's where they want to breed the doses in their cage. Okay. Um, I had a breeder when I first got started in rabbits, he says, I'll give you a little secret that, that may help you. I go, say that, he says, I always breed on the upswing of the weather. Say it's say it's 40 today. Tomorrow it's going to be 60. I'll breed tonight. But if it's 60 tonight or today, and it's going to be in the 30s tomorrow, I'll wait till it will start temperature starts to go up again. Hmm. He says you'll have better conception rate. Right and I've been doing that for like I say since back in the late 70s. It seems to work pretty good. I'll basically, I've tracked it over years and I'll be in the 90, 92 to 95 percent consumption rate. It's just a, I don't know, he just told me this years ago. He's gone now. You know, something that kept in my mind. Interesting. You know, which is kind of interesting too to talk to some of the older breeders get a lot of good ideas from different ones and get pointers on this and that. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Big thing is if you're gonna do meat pens, just have fun. It's, it's a learn experience and it's it's a lot of fun. I know some of the fairs now are changing a little bit where you can buy your pens. I still like to do it the old fashioned way where you raise your own pens and bring them there. Um, you know, it just seems, seems to teach you some things, especially the kids will teach them how to take care of their apps and how to get them, you know, get them going. Up here on the table too. I mean, there's different information on those too. Uh, 
just things I've kind of developed over the years. So, I enjoy going and talking to different people and different kids. Um, I've done this throughout the United States, so it's talks. <laughs> but it's fun. Uh, I enjoy judging fairs. They give me some perspectives on how they do that. Good. Yeah, you're on track. So what's the strangest thing you've ever seen? Strangest thing? Um, well, like I say, at, at, at um, Checker Giant, meet Ben. That was one of the <laughs> crazy things I've seen at a fair. Um, <coughs> some fairs, you know, I, I judged a couple of fairs one time years ago. And a lot of the pens were like two Californians, one New Zealand. Okay. And the next pen you know, went down, okay, they had a satin and a cal and a New Zealand. Well, maybe they maybe their books all. I talked to the superintendent and I said, well, I remember it. I'm supposed to judge these by area standards, which are supposed to be all the same breed. And if you're doing, doing things, you're yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. So I just qualified some. You know, we went to lunch, and he says, uh, "Would you be interested in coming back and judge next year?" I go, uh, "Yeah, but I don't know if they people want me back." <laughs> <laughs> nah, don't worry about it. So I went back the next year. We didn't have any pens that were mixed up. They were all either Californians, they were either satin, they were either, either New Zealand. All right. Everybody learned something. That's awesome. So that was, that was good. I enjoyed it. That was good. So. A question. If, sure. if we do, um, like someone wants to do a meat pen, mm -hmm. like an art show, mm -hmm. the, the age limit is 10 weeks? 10 weeks. So the breeding date that they put, and we're we were late. Sorry. So if you already answered this, the breeding date that they put on the flyers is that the date you should be putting the buck and the doe together for the first time? Then yeah, this flyer here. Yeah. Out there, it is on here. Breed date August sixteenth. 2023. Mm -hmm. The show is November 24th. So let's count back in 100 days. And, you know. So, so on we, that date, we should put them together that day right. and hope that it takes. Right. Hopefully, okay. hopefully, they breed that day. If they don't breed that day, then try on the next day. Okay. And try to stay in that top, like I say, 95 to 100 day range. It just be to them. Get a little more chance you know, you're going to have the extra days to, to grow. Okay. Yeah. So the breed date is the oldest date. Like they could be younger, they just can't be older than that date. Right. Like I say. First, yeah. You know, so that's when you would first start. 100 days, 100 days, you know, 31 days is basically the thing. So it's actually like 69 days old. Okay. So it's around the 10 years. So that's why, that's why I say you find out what day you're going to be showing at your fair, mm -hmm. and then you come back 100 days, and that's when you want to breed. Yeah. So it just has to be within the 100 days. 100 days, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, for these fairs that allow them to buy them like and they don't have the parents with the rabbits and stuff at what age are they getting them then that the kids like how just out of curiosity a lot of I wonder times, how that works a lot of them are buying them somewhere six weeks to eight weeks usually within that range so they only because they have for like two weeks depends because or? a lot of fairs a lot of fairs will have a date when they have to be have to have their animals for their, their fair you know, so you got to be in that in that range. So every every county is a little bit different. Um, so the big thing is just find out in their fair book and what the county 
requirements are. And, Talk to your superintendent of your fair. Yeah. Of the superintendent of the fair. Because like you know, our because lots because my fair in Iasco County, you can purchase your rabbits, um, your babies, and bring them into the weigh-in on the end of June, and that's a month before fair. Okay. And our meat pen is eight to twelve weeks. Yeah. Oh. It, like I say, some fairs are different. They have different requirements. They may not, not all your counties will go by the ARB rules. So it's good to find out what your county fair is, you know, rule book is. Because um, it may give you a little bit of a window, a little more. But basically, ARB is, you know, 69 days, 70 days. On that, how often do you see if the <clears throat> weights are different depending on the county fair? That they don't call, that they say they're following ARBA, but they're not. Uh, yeah, some of them will be. They have a different range as far as their weight range. Um, I've had some fairs where the weight range went all the way to five and three quarter. You know, so you know the rabbits are going to be older. But then I've had them where, say they were 12 weeks, 12 weeks is a eight range, and you'll see Florida whites. So, okay, Florida whites, yeah, they're still only going to be like four and a half. They're not going to be up to that five and a half pound range. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of the breeds you want to do is the ones that are going to get you to, like I say, five, five and a quarter range. So you don't have to hold them back. That's the thing I don't, it's, you don't want to hold your rabbits back and make them lose weight. Same if you're doing just your regular class rabbits. You don't want to hold them back to keep them under, say, Californians or Junior Doe, it's gonna be under eight and a half pounds. It's over eight and a half pounds, and it's only four and a half months old. And you're gonna have to move it up, or wait till it gets a little bit bigger. Yes. Let's change the topic, but uh, when you're picking up and handling them, mm -hmm. how important is it to not scruff the rabbits? Scruff the rabbits? You don't want to scruff any of your rabbits. As far as you know, if you pick them up, you want to get them underneath and get them up to you like this. You don't want to pick the rabbit up behind your, behind your ears, shoulders, and pick them up, which I call suitcasing. You don't want to do that because all you're going to do is loosen that fur or loosen that flesh right there over the top of those shoulders, and it's going to just kind of like hang and be loose. So you want to just kind of get underneath them and get, get them up quick. Um, rabbits are, you know, you, I kind of compare them, okay. Cats you can pick up, and if they jump out of your out of your arm, they're gonna land on their feet. Okay, rabbits you pick them up, and if they jump out, you don't have good control of them. They can jump out, but they could end up fall down and they could end up breaking the back, uh, break toenails off if they're a bigger rabbit. You know, hit their mouth, break teeth. So you know. They're just a little bit different, so you want to make sure, kind of go like your showmanship and see that and how you pick them up and get them underneath your arm and get them pulled. You know, even if you're just showing them in an open show, it's not even doing them with your forage. You still want, I still want to get them up close to me and pull them tight. But I don't, I don't pick them up by their shoulders. No. No. So when you turn them over, you're, I would put my finger between your ear and kind of turn them over, not pull on it behind, behind your ear. But like I said, the more you handle them, the more they get used to being handled and picked up, and then you, okay, I know you're going to turn me over and you're going to pick me up. Yeah. Yeah, one more it always question. makes it better for, it makes it better, for, better for the kids if they handle them a little bit when they're younger and they're going to use them for showmanship. 
they're going to do a better one going to challenge them so when they're going through their steps, they got the ramp board and stuff off. What about picking them up by the loin? By the loin? I've seen, I've seen different, I've seen different breeds. Grab them by the loin. And I like to get my hand underneath them and get them up close. I don't like to pick them up from the top as far as the loin or the shoulders. Yes? Just one quick question that might be dumb just because I don't know any rabbits. And so like at the fair, they're 10 weeks old and a lot of these meat pens might go to the auction at the fair. Mm -hmm. Do they eat them at 10 weeks old or do they get bigger before they eat it? It depends on how, who bought it. You know, if they just say, okay, you know, I bought them today, and some fairs will have a processor already set up and they'll take them and get them processed and they pick them up. You know, but if you buy them and you take them home, you know, you can raise them and keep them for dollars and bucks for the next year, or you can raise them a couple more weeks. What, yeah, what is the average size that people eat rabbits? Uh, most of the time, most, <laughs> most of the meat buyers in that, they want them somewhere in that five to six pound okay. range. You know, wide weight. Okay. So when they'll dress out, they'll dress out right around the three pound. Um, yeah. And so you want them six months or younger to have that good tender meat. Yeah, the older the, the older the rabbit gets, the tougher it is. And when you're when you cook rabbit, you don't want to cook it fast on high heat. You want to do it a lower temperature. Otherwise, they'll get a little tough. You know, I like myself, I like to cook them in a crock pot on low heat and cook them overnight. I just take a bunch into where I work and I take two crock pots, six, eight rabbits, and I to keep them in my office until it's lunchtime. Otherwise, the guys would just take them and eat them. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thing. Yeah. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.